The title of this of this um, of this talk was Peak Oil, Drugs and Crime, because when we're talking about the social situation in Britain and most other industrialised countries in the world, we have to look at the crime rate and what is making society quite unsafe in some areas. Most parts are fine, but in some areas, crime rate is extremely high. In some areas, at particular times of the day, or in places all the time. You know, the state, the police, are not the established authority. It is people who run gangs. And broadly, gangs are funded by drugs. And broadly, crime in this country is... The, number 10 Downing Street did a very interesting uh, survey or a, a look at drug laws and crime in Britain in 2005. And it was so interesting that they didn't release it. They kept it quiet. Luckily, it was leaked to The Guardian. What they found was that 57% of all crime in Britain was caused by people with a Class A drug habit. Okay? People who were medically addicted to various different drugs, mostly smack and crack, and had to commit crime to feed this drug habit. Okay? They found 85% of shoplifting people with a Class A drug habit. 80% of burglaries, people with a class A drug habit. Overall, it was 57% of the crime in this country caused by people with a class A drug habit. Now, what happens when you've been burgled? You know, you don't trust your neighbours, you feel a bit unsure, you don't know who did it, you feel like you've been violated. And it means you sort of look inwards more. Areas of high crime, community tends to be not so strong. That's a broad generalisation, we can all think, I think, of areas in particular around here where there's high crime rate and there are strong community groups. But as a broad generalisation, you know, if you've been mugged or burgled, you tend not to trust people quite so much. And coming in for the situation we're coming into with climate change, peak oil, we desperately, desperately need a cohesive society. Okay, we need to be sharing out the remaining resources and not simply letting wealthy people buy them up and leaving nothing for everybody else. <coughs> but it's very difficult to, to have a cohesive society if there's a high crime rate <coughs> and people don't really trust people. So, there's two solutions here. The first one is to do with Class A drug use. Okay, we would simply, and I'd say we as Greens and many other people, would simply redefine Class A drug use as a medical problem and not wait for it to become a crime problem. Okay, people who are addicted to heroin, we say bring them into the NHS, provide them with prescription doses of heroin to be taken on the premises, shooting galleries is, is the phrase that's often used, um, and give, offer that as a first step to a range of consensual treatments to get people off crack or smack. Okay? What happens if you do that? The crime rate goes down dramatically because addicts don't have to buy heroin on the street, and if they don't have to buy heroin on the street, then they don't have to mug or burgle to get the money to buy the heroin. And that would also mean that there would be less dealers around, because less people are buying. And if there are less dealers around, that means less new addicts, which means less prostitution if the addict's female, or less burglary or muggings or whatever, shoplifting if, if the addict is male. Okay, so we think that fairly basic policy, whilst it probably wouldn't cut all of the 57% of crime that Class A addicts cause, but it would certainly go for quite a large percentage of it. 
And you know, this is not a new idea. The government, well, the Labour government was talking about it in 2003. Um, and they, all they've done is produce three trial areas of providing heroin on prescription um, in Brighton, Darlington, and at the Maudsley down in Camberwell. With small numbers of people, sort of 50, 80, that sort of thing, all hardened addicts who failed on every other method of, of trying to get off it. And the result is that, I think it was something like 80% eight, of those people on the, uh, on the trials, they basically stopped buying street heroin. Their lives were getting stabilized, you know, getting stable housing, part-time work, these sort of things. But the main thing was that the crime rate just dropped hugely. Okay, so the reason I bring that up, this up is that if we're gonna have a cohesive society for troubled, choppy waters ahead to do with climate change and peak oil, we need to have a cohesive society. And one of the main things there is changing the drug laws to bring class A drug addicts back into the fold, treat them as a health issue and not wait for it to become a crime problem. Okay. Um, and the other way to share out the remaining supplies of oil, you know, I said if, before, if we leave it simply to the market to decide the price of oil, energy, the price will shoot up. All right, and the analogy is if you've got a piece of cake and a whole load of people who want cake, how are you going to divide it up? Do you divide it into 12 sections so that all 12 people get a slice? Or do you say, this cake is for sale, only very wealthy people will be able to buy the cake. You know, I, I think we would all agree that it's fair to share, that we should be slicing up the cake equally. And similarly, for the remaining supplies of easy to get fossil fuels, we would argue that we should divide up the share equally in a way that doesn't force climate change. What does that mean? That means that as a virtue of you being a citizen in this country, that you should get a tradable energy quota, a ration if you like, a ration of how much fossil fuel or how much carbon dioxide you can emit. All right? So it's a bit like in the Second World War when times were tough, the whole country realized that, that we were under great stress and, stress and pressure, and so the most basic energy supplies for everybody, i.e. food, we had rationing, which worked pretty well. You know, the, the health of Britain was actually pretty good during the Second World War. Um, by the end of the Second World War, pretty healthy. It was shared out equally. We're arguing we should be, do the same thing for remaining fossil fuels. Everybody gets a tradable energy quota. If you use that quota, that's great. If you lose, use less than your quota, i.e. if you live a green lifestyle or if you're poor and don't have many outgoings, you can sell the part of the quota that you don't use. And if you want to go and visit family in Australia or whatever and use more than your quota, then you can buy extra quota to emit extra amounts of carbon dioxide. Okay, so it's redistributive in that wealth will flow from the rich who use a lot of fossil fuels to the poor who don't use their full, full fossil fuels. So we will start to reduce the division in society and it will be equitable. We'll be starting from the basis that we're all in this together, we've got to try and do it fairly. So I think two key things there to help us through these troubled times with climate change and peak oil. Tradable energy quotas, personal tradable rations, and changing the drug laws. In particular, changing how we deal with class A drug addicts.